let me give you a quick intro about myself. My name is Hartmut Kraft. I hold a CPP and a PMP title and from my university days in MA. Um, security consultancy lead for Asia in the Kandal Singapore office. I was born and raised in Germany, but I've been living in APEC, in APEC region actually for uh, since 2003. And since early 2017, I've been living in Singapore. Been in security since 2005, specializing in security design, consulting, creation of global security standards for MNCs, etc. And I am a security consultant now. I have been doing project management since 2005. I've also worked as a key account manager, operations manager, program manager, sales manager, you name it, um, all of that. I've worked with 48 clients, mostly uh, multinationals, but also, for example, embassies, consulates, banks, tech industry, manufacturers, etc. I've done projects in 22 countries, mostly in Asia Pacific, of course, but also here with Denmark and the UK in Europe and with Guatemala and the US in the Americas, but just as a slight introduction. And uh, our agenda for tonight, first and foremost, of course, is a quick introduction to the topic, the security aspect in project management. Then uh, we look at why we need to bring in security early in the project. Then we look at what mostly happens other than the ideal picture that we usually have, how we make the best of what most happens. We have a little bit of a summary and then we have time for Q&A. So security aspect in project management. Now in this webinar, we're going to look into the security discipline as a part of the project management, meaning, how do the services of security consultants and security system integrators fit into the project and how is it usually treated and dealt with? I'm pointing this out and you will understand in about a minute because this circle here represents the project. Yeah. And now we need to ask ourselves, where does security sit within this project? Is it here, right in the center, like the most important thing? Maybe not. Is it up here, right on top of everything? Maybe not the most important aspect, but pretty high on the agenda. Also, maybe not. Is it down here? Yeah, right below everything, kind of at the bottom of the agenda. And if you are now smiling, then you probably know that this is probably more true than anything else. Now, I've done a Google search on exactly this topic, the security aspect in project management. And I got, I'm not kidding you, 6.13 billion results in less than half a second. But then I started to take a closer look. And here, this is the first one. So that is the most relevant and security in the context of project management can therefore be defined as the identification of potential risks and implementation of strategies which will protect or preserve the confidentiality, integrity and availability of project resources. And that basically is what the knowledge area of risk management from the project management body of knowledge is actually talking about. So it's not how does the security discipline fit in there. Other results, they talk about project management in IT security projects, which is also a totally different thing. Now, pretty much none of the links that I have found talks about our topic today, the security discipline inside the project management lifecycle. So one notable exception I have found, and that would be the Security Industry Association, SIA on their website, because they give you an introduction to the CSPM course, which is the Certified Security, Prote Certified Security Project Manager, sorry, which is basically a short version of the PMP certification based on the PMB OK, with some specifics for the security discipline thrown in. Yeah. And I'm not kidding you. I looked through the first 30 
pages of that Google search and I found nothing. Exactly zero that is about our topic today. And that actually begs the question, why? Why in this day and age where we're so highly connected over the internet and we can virtually find every information within a fragment of a second as we've seen and on top of that in mind boggling quantities as we've also seen, why do we not have any information about our topic today? Now, let's talk about the necessity of bringing security discipline early into the project because um, we are still apparently not out there. Yeah, As we've just seen, we, there's no result that we can find. So why is it that security is not getting invited to the project from the beginning because we're always forgotten. Yeah, let's have a look at what people think security does. Yeah, so here, when people outside of the security industry think, what does security do? What comes up? Card readers and cameras. That's it. That that's all they can think of when they hear security. Now let's have a look at what we actually do. And that would be this, yeah? So here, basically where we start, one, two, three, four, in one, we actually look at the security requirements. We do risk assessments, we do blast assessment, vehicle dynamics, etc. you name it. Basically, we built the foundation of the security project. Based on these findings, then, we go to plan and design, and that is when everything comes together in a picture. We go to the implement and operate, which is basically when we install everything, when we do the TNC and the handover. And also, what some people forget, is we monitor and review existing facilities, existing systems. Is everything going according to what we've designed it for? or are there things that we need to tweak, things that we need to change? Yeah, Is the equipment still up to date, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And all of a sudden we have a much, much bigger and comprehend more comprehensive picture than card readers and cameras. Yeah, And of course, when you're doing this right, then you also have a risk-based approach. And don't worry, I'm not going to bore you with the details of this. I'm sure you all know that. But the risk-based approach basically makes sure that we do not over or under-engineer our system and that it's really fit for the purpose we're designing it for. Yeah. So if we do this right, we save the client this pile of money and probably more. Yeah. But you have to be the security expert to do this, and you have to come in as early as possible. Why is that? Now here, I have a chart from a book, and I have to point out this. Actually, I had to ask a friend of mine to take this picture for me because I couldn't find this online. This is from this book, Mr. Hans Sommer wrote the book Pro Project Management im Hochbau. And it's a German book, so please bear with me for the translations that's coming up. Now, this here, actually, it shows on this axis, on the horizontal one, the project duration. And on the vertical axis, you see the level of influence in percent that you can take at what stage. Yeah. Now, this curve here, this in gray, shows the influence on planning. And you can already see it starts from 100% and then goes down rapidly until it is here, say 60, 65% of the project duration, it's already at zero. Yeah? Then we have that black graph here with this funny little thing. That actually shows the influence on the appointment of contractors. And uh, in a minute, you will actually understand why this goes like this when the English comes up here. And then last but not least, here, this curve shows you the influence on changes that you can have. And that is already pretty slim. So now, 
anybody who gets into the project here at the preparation and pre and the pre planning stage basically comes in at the ideal time. Simple reason you look at this here. 100% starts here. You're coming in before even at higher than 100%. And that is where you want to be because all the options are open to you. Absolutely everything. Yeah. So this is the ideal time to come in. Here is the 30% concept design. And when you come in here, it's still good. Simple reason. You're starting at 100% influence. Yeah? That is still Good, yeah, absolutely. But you can already see here in the 30% concept design stage how the level of influence drops rapidly. Yeah. And at the end of the 30% concept design, which happens somewhere around oh, 25%, uh, not here, 20% of the project, you're already down to only 75% 70, level of influence. Yeah, and it's only 30% concept design. When you come in here at the 60% design development, it's already questionable if it's still possible for you to do things. Yes, you have a 75% level of influence, but mostly architectural and structural changes now are harder to achieve. And if you need to get those done, you will have more resistance. So it's, yeah, as I said, questionable. Yeah. When you come in here, which is the RFP stage, and that also explains this graph here for the influence on appointment of contractors. Well, look at it. 40% of the project duration are done, but you're down to say somewhere in the vicinity of 50% influence and that's too late, seriously. Yeah? Because there's not really much, much left for you to do. And then of course, when you come in here at the implementation stage, now, well, that's what I wanna call way too late. Yeah, because you're down to 35% level of influence and pff, that's nothing. You can't really do anything with this anymore. Now with the knowledge that we take from this chart, combined with the fact that security is a lot more than just card readers and cameras, yeah, it must be clear to anybody that we need to be brought into, this pro into any project at the very beginning, here, right at the preparation and brief, preferably. Yeah? Um, if we do the planning here, right, then we can contribute to cost savings that more often than not, well, it's easier to fix something from the very beginning than dealing with an existing problem where you have to throw more money, more energy, more time at it to achieve a less than optimal result. So this is, yeah, this is questionable. So now, we were talking about bringing security in at the very beginning. Yeah, let's have, let's talk about what mostly happens because unfortunately we don't live in an ideal world. Now, this is when we usually come in, right? Five minutes before 12, last minute, this is usually what happens. I mean, I've been doing security since 2005. I've been doing project management since 2005. I've done somewhere in the vicinity of 700 projects, big, small, anything. Yeah? And when I look back on my experience, it mostly was this. Mostly they actually brought me in when it was too late. Yeah? Usually all the architectural and structural design was finished. No real changes were possible anymore. They brought us in as our, at RFP stage at best, sometimes only at implementation. Yeah. Now, that was especially true in my times when I was working uh, with system integrators. Yeah. Now as a consultant, I have to be honest, some of our clients bring us in from the beginning, but by far not all of them. Yeah. And remember,
remember 2005, I was new to security. I was new to project management. And I thought, well, it's normal to get something like this. Yeah, You have your finished floor plan. Everything is there. And now, OK, you design your system based on what you are given as an um, architectural reality. Yeah, The facts are there. Now design your system around that. And sometimes that works. Uh, and sometimes you think, wow, they could have asked me earlier because that doesn't work out so, so easily anymore. Now, that is also the time when you have to get creative. And creative usually means more equipment, higher cost, etc. When you ask for changes, people go like, oh, it's too late. Sorry, we can't really change this anymore. Deal with what you have. Mm -hmm. And not sure if that's also something that you have experienced, but um, maybe we can we can have a show of hands or something in the plenum. Who has been in a situation where you actually were brought in a project into a project so late that you thought, well, you should have brought me in earlier because now it's actually more difficult and gonna cost more. Anybody ex have any experience like that? Yes, a lot. Okay, perfect, perfect. Thank you. That's <laughs> yeah. as you can imagine, that was the answer yeah. I was expecting. Thank you. So, and uh, that is also the time when I was asking myself, why is it that we're always so neglected? Yeah, and that is also when I realized people think of us as card readers and cameras. Yeah, we had that before. We were talking about this, and it's just not right. Now. As a matter of fact, I also found out that some people, if they only think of us as card readers and cameras, we're still pretty well off because I've made the experience that we are, we security people, are regarded as a nuisance because we prohibit people to go into areas where they think they belong or where they want to be. Yeah. Others say, oh, yeah, you make me wear this damn badge all the time with the stupid lanyard. I don't like it, blah, blah, blah. Or one of my favorites is also um, smokers. You know, they prop open the door and we security people, we install our alarm and then the alarm goes off and they can't keep the door open and they have to close the door and walk all the way around the, the building just because they want to have a cigarette. And so you're not in that good book, actually. Yeah. And this is also sometimes happening. And this is really because we are reduced to card readers and cameras, yeah? And then with that, they think, oh, well, it's only card readers and cameras. I mean, come on, just have the ELV guys design the damn thing, yeah? Let them do that and bring in the system integrator later and all good, no problem. And don't get me wrong, I'm not talking bad about ELV engineers. Absolutely not. Because I'm sure they can put together the baseline specifications of the security system. But remember what the security specialists do. This, yeah, all of that, all that we've, we've spoken about, we laid a foundation. And on that, we built the plan and design and so on and so forth. And I'm sorry, but uh, as an ELV engineer, you are not necessarily a security expert and you miss a lot of that stuff because security risk assessment, blast assessment, vehicle dynamics, that needs specialists and we are those specialists. We can do this. But if you don't know what we bring to the table, you can't engage us for this. And this is really the problem that I see with the whole thing, yeah? So now, as I said, I work a lot with MNCs, multinational corporations. Yeah. And many of them, or some of them, well, a good number of them, they have standards. And when I say that, I mean standards in capitals. Yeah. Really well defined, really well worked out. And they stick to this, and there's no budging on anything, and there's no, no compromise, etc. You can always work this out it must be along the standards, yeah? And then of course, I also have made this experience, standards. 
yeah, like not so capital, not so well worked out. Uh, sometimes you get the exp you get the impression, okay, they have standards and they don't really take them seriously because uh, ah, it's something we like to have and uh, you know we can show this. It's good for marketing, but honestly, we don't really care that much and do whatever you like. Had that before, yeah. And then of course you have also clients who have nothing, yeah, which is also not very good. Now. The problem is security can really contribute. Eh? We know that, we as security experts. The world out there does not seem to know this. Yeah? And that is when we actually have to speak up. Yeah? Because frankly, even decades, oh, sorry, here, we can, we can, I totally forgot about that. We can still save them the pile of money yeah, if we do that. But People don't know that because card readers and cameras, yeah? So <sighs> we've been around for decades, security, yeah? And actually IT security is much younger than we are in physical security, electronic security, but everybody's talking about IT security. Who are the people that talk about us? Honestly, I think it's time for us to get out of the shadows of our little small niche and step into the limelight so everybody really will understand what we bring to the table yeah and if i may say this um, i have chosen this picture of a woman not only because of the beautiful colorful dress but also as a statement that we need more women in security so we are brought in late. Unfortunately, that is a very common experience. Now we need to make the best of it. How do we do this? Because we still have to work with the situation somehow. We can't say, oh, you brought me in late, so you only get bad service, bad, well, you, you take what you, what you get from us. Can't do that. Yeah? We still need to make it work. So within the project yeah, here, Security is here. We are a tiny, tiny discipline that is part of the whole project. Mm -hmm. That is true. Yes, security is not the biggest, admittedly, but we are still important. Now, in reality, we also know the situation that we sit through a two, three hour meeting, and only in the last five minutes, we actually get our turn to speak. Now, by that time, this happens. Yeah? People doze off, people have left, people play, I don't know, on their phone or something. Yeah, And this is then when we from security are given the time to say what we need to say. Um, yeah, that's a bit of a challenge. I found that a bit difficult to deal with in the very beginning. And then um, I found a way because um, in this little time, you just need to be very focused and very, very uh, on the ball. And what you need to do can be summarized with the motto of the Boy Scouts of America, and that is be prepared. Absolutely be prepared and be prepared from the very first step in the project. Yeah, when you when you start with the whole thing, you need to be prepared. How do you do that? Over the years, I found out that there are some topics that come up in every security project, no matter how big, how small, no matter who the client, none of that matters because some things are always going to come up. And over the years, I've put together an actual list of these topics. So I don't have to think about every single one again and again. And I would like to share this list with you, which by no means is extensive, of course. I mean, that can be expanded to what you need, but just to give you an idea. And in a minute, you will understand what, what it is behind that. So in every project, first and foremost, what I needed was some wall space in the IT room or wherever the head end equipment for access control and VSS usually sits, but access control usually goes on the wall. 
So I, A, I need to make sure I have that space. Huh? I need to make sure there is enough. And not only that, I also need to make sure I can open the cabinets and there is enough room to work on them. You need to stand and not, not squat down, not go up on a ladder to work on the whole thing. It needs to be a convenient space in the IT room. It also needs to have a flame retardant backside, either the wall or a plywood that's on the back, etc. all supplied, not by us. We don't allocate the wall space. We don't provide the flame retardant plywood on the back. Somebody else does. They need to know. Another thing is, well, we need power, the 220 volt, 110 volt, depending on where the, where the um, uh, project is. You need to have the power for the security head end equipment. You need to tell the electrical contractor how many you need, where you need them, and when you need them. Yeah. Another thing is, for example, the grounding bar where the IT, uh, where, where the, where the, where the head end equipment sits, let's say the IT room. That also is provided by the electrical contractor. Yeah. And of course, we need either a rack or at least rack space for our VSS equipment. Yeah? We don't we don't supply the racks. That's not part of our scope of work. Somebody else does. Yeah. So we need to let them know. Cable containment. Yeah. We don't usually do this. General contractor does this, but we need to tell them, hey. Our cable containment needs to be of that material, needs to be that size, needs to be running along these lines. And please, please, please make sure that we are not sharing this because it's a best practice that cable containment for security be only for security. Yeah, we need to let them know. Then, of course, let's say, depending on the client, depending on the system, but I've had that too, that uh, the door controllers are actually mounted above the doors that they control. So you would actually have to make sure you have the space for the security junction boxes that need to be above the door. I've been in projects where I hadn't spelled that out first. And then of course there was no space for me. I had to move it to like five meters away, which is my, mind you, it's not exactly ideal. Yeah, it's not really good. And then of course, if you have these security junction boxes above the door, you need service hatches if you have a false ceiling. Otherwise, how do you get to that to the junction box? You can't service it. So a service hatch, yeah? And then of course, something that I had to run after in many, many projects is a door schedule. I don't know why, but uh, you would expect to have a kickoff meeting, you get a door schedule and it's fine, but no. Oh, no, sorry, we don't have that yet. We don't have that yet. Yeah, if you don't give me a door schedule, I don't know what kind of material I'm dealing with. I can't plan my locks and um, hey, you can't have that. You're, you're setting me up to actually delay the project. Can't be, so give me the door schedule. Yeah, and then of course you have openings for the locks. We're talking about mortise locks and either wooden doors or um, metal doors, for example. We don't make these openings. The door manufacturer does. Yeah. So we probably know at the kickoff meeting what kind of lock we need in which kinds of doors. What I have done in the past, I've always made sure that I had, I don't know, a few mortise locks standard ones, I would say, lying around. And then I would actually bring one to the kickoff meeting and physically give it to the door manufacturer and say, hey, by the way, take this, give it back to me when you're done doing all the openings for the locks. Thank you very much. Yeah. And same goes for door closers. Yeah? Door closers need to be on doors that actually have access control on them. Otherwise, your system is all of a sudden useless. Yeah, uh, doors wide open, etc. We don't supply the door closes. The door manufacturer does, the GC does, anybody but us. This is not part of what we do. Yeah? So we have to point that out. We need to hook up the system to the fire alarm. I mean, that's a given, of course. That's so, so basic that many people don't even think about this, but you need to spell it out. And yes, you could, you could continue this list 
for another day, I suppose. Yeah. What I want to say is all these things are fairly small things. Yeah. They're so small that they like that they often get overlooked. They are clear to us as the security professionals, but they are not clear for anybody else. So what I did, I put this together in a nice comprehensive list. It looked really nice with a, with a cover page and everything. I had a little, little section written for everything. And I had attachments with drawings, with uh, specifications, with anything you could ask for. And then I PDF'd it. Yeah. And for any of the projects, I would send it out before I have the kickoff meeting. And I send it out to everybody in the invitation of, for the kickoff meeting. I would make it very, very clear. Hey guys, this is what security needs from third parties. I would spell out and it was in the document. Okay, this third party needs to provide that, et cetera, et cetera. And then in the kickoff meeting, I would actually talk about exactly this. I would seek out the electrical guys, the GCs, um, the door manufacturers, et cetera, et cetera. And I would tell them, look guys, this is what's coming up. You need to make sure this is there. Yeah? And if you are prepared, yeah? if you are that prepared, then you don't need a lot of time. Remember, we're talking about the last five minutes when everybody dozed off. And basically what I found, you need to go in with a bang. Yeah, You need to wake them up again and then make sure Okay, I'm not stealing much of your time, but this is what needs to be done. Thank you very much. Okay, and that usually worked. Yeah, If you can show them that you actually have something to contribute in a professional and concise and well-prepared way, that will actually give you a lot of credits. I was surprised how well that worked. Now, naturally, of course, you don't give this out once and then everybody comes to you, you have to chase them, but that's just typical for a project. You always have to chase people. That's not a problem. Yeah? On the other hand, um, this is a list of, of things that I told them about. Now uh, I have a list for you of what I find useful habits that I found particularly helpful, not only in general project management, but particularly for a project manager in security. Yeah. And the first one, well, we had it already, always be prepared and preferably be better prepared than anybody else and be better prepared than only what you need for the next upcoming meeting. Talk to the crowd about what's coming up in two or three meetings, maybe in three or four, four or five meetings. Yeah. Hey, by the way, uh, in five weeks, we're going to have the TNC. Can you please make sure that my network is ready? Thank you very much. Yeah? This kind of thing, you know, look forward and not only a little bit, look forward and anticipate what might be happening. Yeah. So preparation is absolutely key. Another one that I found is be proactive. Proactive in communication because communication is 95% of what a project manager does anyway. Yeah? And communication can be done in so many ways. Best one that I found is to be proactive. Remember, we are a small discipline. People don't usually come to us. So what do we have to do? We need to come to people. Yeah? We need to approach them. We need to speak up when we have an issue, because if we don't speak up, nobody will. Yeah? Nobody will help us. And this is really so important. I can't over, overstate that. Yeah? Also, what I found is don't be afraid to speak up. I, I said in meetings where I knew people were affected by what was just said, but they didn't speak up because, yeah, no, it's a small thing and it always happens and I just deal with it. Yeah, well, with that kind of attitude, we are never getting out of that shadowy niche and into the limelight. No, we need to make sure we're heard. We need to be sure, sure we're seen yeah, in the project. 
we don't have to make us bigger than we are, but we have to make sure we are just on equal terms, on par with everybody else. Yeah? And that is why we have to speak up. Yeah? And if there is something wrong that affects security, well, yes, please, uh, I have something to say about that. Just as well, you need to listen very closely. And that is actually something that I underestimated in my early days for, for, um, for project management, because uh, I thought like, okay, I'm security and I don't really have to listen when the structural guys or the lighting guys or the furniture guys or the carpet guys talk. And that was wrong. Yeah, because so many things can actually have an impact on when I can do my work. As we all know, we need walls, we need ceilings to install our stuff. We need doors and door frames. We need a network. We need to make sure that the carpet is in because uh, only then can we install the furniture and only then can we install on that furniture equipment like um, yeah, panic buttons and uh, intercoms, etc. cetera. Yeah? So everything is important. And that is why we need to listen closely when anybody speaks, yeah? And then of course, we also have to make sure we all know of the stakeholders, yeah? Of course, we need to know who we have to talk to. And it's really important that you especially know those stakeholders that are very important for you, the lead PM, the client, the network provider, the GC, the door vendor, the furniture vendor, I mean, the list goes on. And when I make, when I say, make sure you're aware of all of them, don't stop at, okay, I know this guy's name. No, in pre-COVID times, when it was still possible to sit in a meeting room together and probably also shake hands and speak to people, I would exactly do that mostly after the meeting, but you approach them, you make sure that you introduce yourself and you make sure they know that you're security, yeah? You tell them your name, you give them your name card, you probably chat with them a little bit, uh, you have a coffee with them, anything that makes you memorable. Because what you wanna achieve with this is, oh, yeah, right, 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 yeah, hot note, the security guy. Yeah, yeah I have his number, uh, give me a minute, I call him, yeah? Or want to be like, oh, yeah, yeah, we have somebody doing security, but for the life of me, I don't know the name. No, no, we need to actually be there, right? And we need to know the stakeholders because that goes together with be proactive. The stakeholders might not approach you, but you need to approach them. And for that, you need to make sure you have spoken to them already. Yeah, that would be very helpful. So I'm very well aware that all of this that I'm saying here on this on this slide is actually, of course, something that is requested from a project manager anyway. Yeah, that is most certainly um, the basic work of a project manager. Now, more often than not in projects, I have found project managers of big disciplines or even the lead project manager to not adhere by this which is why I say I'm from a small discipline. Nobody cares about me. So I need to make sure people can't avoid me. Yeah, they need to actually understand, oh yeah, that's the loud German guy from security. I don't mind as long as I get my stuff done. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, I got people calling me and say, hey, yeah, I, I was in the project with you. Um, I actually have something because I think uh, I would want to work with you on the next project because you got your stuff together. So this is really something that I find extremely useful because, because we are a small discipline, we need to be more on our toes and we need to wow the other people with our knowledge and our approach to the whole thing. So a little bit of a summary, yeah. We need to keep on educating everybody what security really contributes, that people forget about the card readers and cameras and say, oh, yeah, I almost forgot you, de you do that too, but it's really about the big picture. Yeah? And we will not achieve this by not speaking up. We need to keep on educating everybody. Then 
we need to get security into the projects as early as possible so we can actually achieve significant improvements on the project and at the same time save the client a pile of cash. We need to be prepared. We need to be proactive. We need to speak up. We need to listen closely and we need to know the stakeholders because doing an outstanding job is the best marketing, not only for yourself and your company, but also for the security discipline in general. And with that, I thank you very much for listening from, to me tonight. I'm thanking very much Chico and the ASIS Indonesia team for inviting me to speak. And now I think we have time for some Q&A. Thank you so much, Hartmut. And then it's very interesting presentation. So if any uh, question from the audience, maybe I will begin the question uh, just to want to clarify, Hartmut, uh, for yeah. the, uh, uh, you have the uh, security aspect uh, in project manage. I mean, that uh, from security requirement to monitor and review, there's a Sabre assessment. What's Sabre assessment? Sabre assessment is something uh, that comes from the UK. Uh, don't forget, uh, Candle is a British company. And okay. this particular uh, picture that I showed you um, mm -hmm. is actually uh, from, from our uh, UK team. Yeah? And oh, Sabre okay. is a very big thing. Um, you, can, you can look it up in BRE. Yeah, that's the, that's the website. And um, they basically give you a guideline on how to uh, do the assessment. Yeah, it is one okay. way of doing this, but it's a very big thing in the UK. And that is why that was on the picture. Oh, okay. So please, if any a question from the audience, uh, please uh, open your microphone. Well, uh, <laughs> it, it's a very interesting presentation. Yes. Uh, and I totally agree. Yeah, with the mm. with the uh, craft uh, statement. Mm. Yeah, and then actually that's what we've been facing for so many decades. Okay, yeah. and I, I I totally agree that uh, as always security comes late. Okay, mm -hmm. in, in 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 my perception, in my experience, actually when project has already been built, has already been established is already been erected, then hey, we have to think about the security. Okay. <laughs> so yep. many, many, many uh, waste of time, waste of energy. And then most of the time we do the rewrite of the, mm -hmm. of the, of the architectural design. Yep. Yep. But overall, exactly. Krav, thank you very much for your uh, insight. Thank you. Evening. Thank you. Uh, any question? From, from the audience, please do so. Yeah, Chico. Uh, uh, please, uh, Amit. If you're okay, again. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so first of all, uh, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Kraft, uh, 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 good and Aben. Uh, good and I hope you're doing well. Uh, thank you so yep. much. Uh, it was a wonderful session. And uh, to my friends, Indonesian friends, uh, you know, uh, Selamat Malam. I thank you so much. Uh, you are such a beautiful people out there. And it was a pleasure seeing you all. Uh, so Mr. Kraft, uh, talking about your session, I think uh, it was a wonderful session. Uh, I think that was, I was looking for, uh, and you had covered all the aspect and whatever you said, I think uh, that's what I'm doing. So I, I'm, whatever I'm doing, it's correct, right? So uh, that's what I hear from you that the way we should do it's yeah, you, uh, you absolutely nailed it. You're right. Uh, we, we get at the very last stage of the project and we don't have too much to do. And whatever things we have to do at the end in a quick succession. So we don't have time uh, and we don't have resources. But yes, then, then we definitely have to do it because we as a security professional, we want the security uh, how it should be. But yes, there are challenges for us. Uh, yep. So thank you so much. Okay. So so coming to one question, which I, yeah. I have, you know, so you, you had covered everything, uh, what I wanted to hear, but uh, one thing was, uh, you know, when are we working on projects, on new buildings, on new offices, uh, what we see uh, is the challenge uh, working with vendors, our security work vendors, uh, getting the work done. Uh, they will always push you delayed. They will uh, always, uh, you keep on holding you or keep your uh, timelines extending. And we have mm -hmm. to meet the timelines given by our organizations. So mm -hmm. how, you, how you push your 
our vendors? What what is your strategy? What is that mantra or that formula you used to you know get our vendors synchronized with our timelines for our projects? Mm -hmm. um, now that um, goes back to the to the times when I worked with uh, system integrators. Uh, what we did usually was um, depending on where we were because um, the companies were all over the all over the world or all over asia pacific at least and um so we had a sizable amount of projects and what we then started doing was ha uh, having really good connections with the equipment manufacturers with the camera manufacturers with uh, hid for the card readers with uh, the cable manufacturers you name it right and then of course we had uh, clients that have certain standards and we would actually work with the clients okay you are our, our uh, key account uh, we have no problem doing some stuff for you for example we make sure that we have a stock of whatever equipment has a long lead time and then if need be we can actually ship this out from our central warehouse to china to japan to india to um to korea wherever you need it yeah yes of course it comes at an additional cost but we make sure you can keep the timeline the same mm -hmm. thing goes then for for example locks yeah? same thing um, you have a certain stock of locks yeah? and you have your really good connections with the vendors yeah? and this continues pretty much for all the critical items yeah? um, also we would make use of uh, let's say uh, equipment vendors they have let's say a special yeah so to say the black friday sale or something yeah you take uh, 20 of my systems and i give you a 25 percent discount or something yeah we would also do this when we have the pipeline for the projects and then of course what comes absolutely into play the the system integrators that need to implement the project yeah you need to have a really good connection with them as well for example Right now I'm doing this. Um, I have some good connections to a camera vendor. Um, I have helped the integrator out of a bit of a rough spot because I made sure they actually get the delivery of the cameras. Yeah? And that of course uh, should be a two way street. Yeah? I help you, dear system integrator. So in time, when times are tired, you need to help me as well. And uh, please put in the extra manpower you need to make sure you have that good connection with them, preferably have a long-standing um, business arrangement with them because then they will be loyal and will help you. Yeah. Right, right, Mr. Kraft, thank you. But you know, as, as we understand that normally we don't work directly with the uh, manufacturers. We have a project a vendor who deals mm -hmm. uh, with, the, uh, with the manufacturer. And that's why we have this, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, we, mm -hmm. we cannot establish contact with them, but yeah, absolutely, we need to work in advance, and and then we can mm -hmm. just put that on time. Just because just because you have to go through a third party doesn't mean you can not establish your contacts with the vendor uh, with with the manufacturer. You should still do this okay. because all the all the manufacturers are usually at the trade shows, right? And I don't know, let's take a few examples, Bosch, Axis, uh, Huawei, uh, you go to them, you introduce yourself, you change, exchange name cards, you follow up, you make sure you get those connections and you get them on a, on a good footing. And you call them, you probably have a coffee with them and you build that relationship, even though they know that you are not allowed to purchase directly from them, but you have to go through somebody else. That mm -hmm. connection with the manufacturer, I found always most important because also for us, we did not buy directly from the manufacturer, mm -hmm. but having this connection was worth its weight in gold, so to say. Uh, right, uh, okay. Grab that helps, I think mm -hmm. that will be something new I should consider. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, one, one last question. If, sure. If, uh, uh, if permit, okay. So, uh, you know, so we have uh, security at entry premises, right? So normally people have access doors, like door opening, and then mm -hmm. we have turnstiles. Uh, yeah. Turnstile help us to control in and out uh, people, but door is like, you know, people can, many people can enter after swiping in. 
So what you prefer at the entry, at the uh, entry into premises, we should have a, a door, a door with two flap doors, or it should be a turnstile. How big is the facility and how many people are going in and out? So you can say uh, like a facility, uh, a multi-tenant facility uh, with any user can be having uh, three to four floors and it can have an opening on all the access elevators. So, you know, this is a dicey where you have multi-tenant, so you cannot have turnstile at the gate. Uh, you can have it on your respective floors. Uh, but uh, uh, so, and mm -hmm. you can have like close to two to three thousand employees getting into office. Well, you can you can consider if you if you can't install uh, the turnstiles uh, because of space constraints or um, because the landlord won't won't let you, you can think about uh, the anti tailgating devices that are out. I, I beg your pardon. What is that? Anti tailgating devices. Tailgating devices. Yeah anti-tailgating devices you can you can think about installing those but then of course you still need to make sure you have the manpower as in security yeah. guards who will follow up if there is somebody right. tailgating yeah. but uh, it will help usually yeah it does help. i agree but yes yeah the control we cannot we will not be guard will not a single guard will not be able to control the flow of you know, 30 Almost, people yeah. coming at one time all right exactly. thanks thanks Karp. thank you no problem. Kind of problem. Thank you. Okay, so uh, this uh, hand raised from uh, Mr. Andreas. Yeah, please, Mr. Andreas, yeah. if you have a question. Thank you. Yeah, very, very interesting presentation, Almut. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Uh, this is uh, the one related to information security. How, how do you ensure that uh, when you design and uh, implement a system, electronic security system, that will not introduce uh, another uh, security vulnerability that can be uh, utilized or tapped in by by external party. So, uh, do you do you normally uh, do this, or uh, will you let uh, the, the the vendor to to do it for you in terms of the cyber security uh, protection? Okay, uh, that I have to say. Um... I don't usually do cybersecurity. I don't don't know anything about uh, how to how to deal with that. I know the general principle, but that is where the thing ends. So I'm not really well equipped to speak about cybersecurity. Sorry for that. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, you you do uh, uh, design and implement the electronic security system, right? Yes, of course we do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, and. Uh, I assume that uh, the system will be connected to the network. Oh, uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, so how, how can you ensure that uh, your, your new system uh, will not be uh, vulnerable to uh, the uh, cyber attack, for example? Oh, okay. Okay. Now, now I understand. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um, zero trust. Do you know that? Zero trust. Oh, okay. Zero trust. You, you implement yeah. zero trust. Okay. Basically, uh, what what that is about, um, you have to. Well, the idea is you plan your system be it an IT security system or a physical security system. And then of course you have the design and then you specify the hardware and you specify the software that needs to run on that. And um, of course you need to make sure the design is correct. And then of course you need to make sure the hardware is reliable. Yeah. And the software is equally reliable. Basically you have to do your due diligence on every single part of the system. And in this particular case also, because the security system will sit within the company network, of course. Yeah. It still needs to be happening in cooperation with the IT department because mm -hmm. they are the experts on the cybersecurity and the hacker attacks. So that being the case, the security system, the physical security system being within this cloud of the IT, that needs to happen in cooperation with, with IT, but not only, yeah. And with, in my opinion, it should actually go without saying that zero trust is implemented everywhere. 
yeah, in electronic security and in IT security, because you need to be able to trust all the hardware and software that's running in your system. And that, for example, is a reason why many European countries have said, uh, okay, for certain applications, we do not allow Chinese hardware mm -hmm. to be in our system, yeah, because we are not sure we can trust them. Um, yeah. And that is, I think, uh, one of the integral parts that sometimes gets overlooked because, okay, we have a nice shiny system, but nobody thinks about, okay, this system is still kind of computer and software. How do we protect it against people who want to get in there? Thank you very much for that question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Bandreas. Uh, thank you, Harold, for the answer. Uh, any further question from, from the audience? Uh, regarding the um, uh, hard mode uh, presentation about the uh, 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 the, pro the project management in security industry. So, Padeswin? Yes, uh, yeah, please. Uh, Chico, uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Good evening. Yeah, uh, I'm, uh, I'm Desvin. Uh, I'm working in the oil and gas company in North Sumatra, in, in Sumatra, sorry, uh, in Jambi and South Sumatra. And um, our premise is uh, our location uh, of the uh, gas station, yeah, natural gas mm -hmm. station, like yep. gas compressor and metering uh, is far from the community, um, mm -hmm. mostly uh, far from community and um, mostly uh, it's not a public area. Yeah, yeah. Uh, far from uh, people, so sometimes I, I have uh, difficulties of uh, for 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 uh, uh, what what uh, to 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 sell my my idea about the security system of the of the uh, our uh, gas station uh, mm -hmm. natural gas station because uh, they always argue that uh, our 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 our. Uh, Location is far from community. There's no threat, um, minimum threat from the people. So, uh, but uh, I'm uh, I'm sure that uh, sometime uh, in some day uh, the the security uh, threat will come because uh, mm -hmm. our facilities is uh, critical infrastructure of uh, uh, of the oil and uh, oil. Uh, Mm -hmm. Gas uh, uh, distribution in uh, its uh, own state uh, company, yeah. So it's important and uh, it's a critical infrastructure uh, because mm -hmm. we 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 export the natural gas to Singapore. So yeah. <clears throat> how how uh, maybe you can uh, give me a little mm -hmm. uh, advice how to mm -hmm. uh, give uh, how, how to sell the idea that you need better security, yes. correct? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, first of all, what if people say, oh, there is no threat. My answer to that would be, why don't we have a TVRA or at least an SRA? Threat vulnerability and risk assessment would be very good. Yeah, first of all. Second of all, um, it's critical national infrastructure. That, and that is for a reason, right? Here in Singapore, for example, well, you have to actually uh, have a, a very special permit to be security consultant for critical national infrastructure. Unfortunately, I don't have that yet, but um, you need to go through courses, you need to be approved by the government, et cetera, et cetera. And there are a lot, a lot, a lot of rules that you need to conform with to be that. Yeah? That is because it's critical national infrastructure and they don't let just anybody do that. Yeah? Um, and what is most important, yeah, oil and gas. A, it's a big facility. And if something happens there, usually the damage is enormous, correct? Yeah. Um, not only the physical damage to equipment and God forbid, life, yeah, but also to the reputation of the company. Yeah. And what always works, in my opinion, is when you go to, well, be it your own company or 
your client in my case as a consultant if you tell them look this is how much your security is going to cost you and this is how much money you would actually have to pay in damages and in reputation loss and in client loss and everything yeah yes your facility is far out doesn't matter and still if it's critical national infrastructure i'm sure there is some terrorist group somewhere that has an interest of damaging this just to make a point and then of course um, you can probably buy your whole security installation 10 times over for the damage one attack does it's it's what i said it's about sharpening the understanding of the decision makers that security is not only needed when you're in downtown Jakarta, for example, it's even needed when you're on an island, yeah, because things might happen. And the people who really want to do damage, they don't care if it's somewhere downtown or somewhere far off. And that is what I would actually um, start with. Yeah, because a TVRA is not that expensive. Yeah, and if it's done right, you have an actual understanding what the threats are. And only then can you then plan on what do you actually need. Does that help you? Yeah. Uh, I, uh, I have uh, make a TVRA uh, assessment, yeah. But mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> the result of TVRA, uh, they disagree about the 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 risk of the security risk of uh, our uh, facilities uh, mm -hmm. because uh, if we uh, talk about the risk uh, security risk uh, assessment, the result is always uh, are not uh, are not big, uh, are not a major uh, because uh, from the likelihood. Uh, there's no terrorist attack uh, ever, have, uh, ever happened in Indonesia for oil and gas target. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, in Indonesia, there's no, uh, uh, it's never uh, occurred uh, the terrorist uh, attack for the uh, critical infrastructure like uh, oil and gas. So the thing uh, that uh, oil and gas facility is not a terrorist target, uh, but for uh, uh, so uh, and the, the uh, like uh, other crime like uh, stealing or uh, fraud. Yes, no, no, not fraud. Uh, stealing uh, or uh, sabotage like, like that is is, mm -hmm. is minor. Yeah, minor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So so I, I can I can uh, sell my idea from, from the TVRA result. <laughs> so, okay. I don't know. Uh, I don't know to uh, what what uh, what uh, method what other methods to to explain <laughs> the, the the idea. Mm -hmm. to okay. Um. You, yeah. Usually, usually, um, the decision makers always want to see. Okay, if I invest this money, what's my return on it? The return on investment needs to be clear, and depending on what it is that you would actually like to do, yeah, you would have you would have to put together a budget for exactly this let's say over the next five years, if that helps, and then calculate, okay, how much return, how much money can I save on what other things? Yeah, And then you can present this because people will always buy into the idea, hey, cool, they're actually going to save me money. Nice. Yeah. Um, that might help as well. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I have to uh, to, uh, to conduct a cost and benefit or ROSI maybe yes. Yes. on security investment uh, assessment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I would do that. Yeah. Let me know how that works out. I'd be interested to know. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you uh, Aircraft. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. Okay. Thank you, uh, Pak Despin. Uh, I I saw Pak Anang uh, raise hand. Pak Anang, any question? Anna. Okay, so I just want to continue the, que the question from Mr. Deswin. So, uh, uh, Hartwood, if, mm -hmm. if the condition, uh, sometimes the uh, 
physical condition in this case like a uh, like a remote area or like mm -hmm. uh, in the uh, for example like the um, uh, offshore uh, station yeah. it's a uh, uh, very depending on the uh, on the uh, uh, natural environment, right? So, uh, the, the, if we do like the for project management in uh, let's say like building in the city, it's a uh, it's a uh, relatively easy to uh, to do a, a security uh, security uh, uh, what's called it uh, risk assessment. Security, yeah, risk assessment or, or works in, in uh, 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 prior to the building uh, uh, established, right? However. Mm -hmm because the uh, yeah we assume that the uh, land is uh, uh, stable and such and such right however mm -hmm. in this in the challenging environment let's say uh, uh, in the steep hills in the area that easy to have the um, uh, but there's a possibility of tsunami for example and, and mm -hmm. earthquake so uh, in this case the security people for the assessment of at the beginning of the stage of the uh, project it's a uh, it's a uh, uh need a specific uh understanding also about about the uh about the uh, environment as well right right but um there i i would like to caution everybody because security people like us we can only achieve so much and for these well geological issues for the weather issues tsunamis uh uh, like now recently in in Australia, the the, the wildfires, etc., or uh, landslides, etc. There are other specialists that need to handle this because mm -hmm. I don't think that we are qualified to talk about that. Yeah. Now okay. we can work together with them, and okay. then even I would say uh, you know construction engineers would probably also have to come in when we're talking about landslides or we're talking about yeah, land sinking or flooding or wildfires etc um that that is that is going way beyond the scope of work for uh, security only i think okay okay so it means that the answer is that we have to work together also for for the expertise in this in this case right exactly because what people, this is some some buildings in jakarta especially it's a it's a capital city however we can found some buildings that um i think uh, the construction was false because they're still <laughs> so so now they are no, they empty they, they they're emptying the building however it's like the construction uh stage was not right right so so now mm -hmm. there's uh, nobody in the, at the building because it's too dangerous and then it's also hard for because it's like in, in the middle of city it's uh hard to uh, you know to uh, tear them down it? yeah tear them down yeah but the thing <laughs> is uh uh in this case uh, security also uh cannot do things because uh, security cannot be said that it's like a because the construction people has a different expertise right in this case right yeah so it's 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 a the assumption for security is when those people works as uh, they have to do based on their expertise, right? So uh, there's the things, right? Okay. And that is exactly, I mean, uh, currently I'm working with uh, one particular client on a number of different projects in different countries. And mm -hmm. um, there's always, well, always campus projects. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And we as security are in from the very beginning and we work together with Everybody, absolutely everybody, structural engineer, um, architects, with the landscapers, with with absolutely everybody. Yeah, and that is very interesting because we also get to understand about their challenges that they, for example, have with uh, what security needs. Yeah, and uh, while there is, a, of course, an understanding of, of course, you need these doors and we can't have that here, etc. Um, they still learn a lot. But on the other hand, we also learn a lot because yeah. what what we say, oh, yeah, well, it's clear that security needs that and that. All of a sudden, you understand, oh, okay, yeah, from a structural point, that might actually be a be an issue or regulations depending on the country yeah uh, if you go to australia you have different regulations than in japan or in singapore in indonesia and uh, there is always uh, something that you can learn and what i really have uh, to say what i really appreciate is that all the disciplines are together and on par equal everybody yeah and that everybody 
just gives input and says, oh, sorry, we can't do this because regulation or that puts a problem here. Uh, so we need to work it out. The level of cooperation that is happening there is really something that I wish would have happened would, would, would happen in every project. Yeah. Okay. Unfortunately, in many projects, there is still not the, the right level of cooperation because everybody keeps to themselves and only do, does their thing. Yeah. And you need a strong project manager to lead everything and keep everything together and have everybody work together. And it means that it returns to your, your presentation just now, right? So mm -hmm. uh, communication is important. Imagine, yeah. Communication also uh, with yeah. those experts, also, right? Correct. Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Any uh, further question? We have uh, five minutes. Ada pertanyaan dari teman-teman yang lain? Ada pertanyaan dalam bahasa Indonesia? Saya akan terjemahkan. If any question from in, uh, in Indonesia, please do so. I will translate it if you want to. Okay. Ada pertanyaan, teman-teman? Silakan. Okay, we have another five minutes. Ada lima menit lagi sebelum kita akan jam sembilan. Okay. Uh, if there's no question, so thank you so much. Yeah, it's very interesting topics. And then we know that uh, project management and security should be like side by side. And then because, yeah, uh, uh, besides safety, security also important in, in the yeah. project management things. So thank you once again for on behalf of uh, Asus Indonesia.